people need the balance and more of us need to do it right so you know i love that shout out to esther west she's one of my favorite people and <laughs> we've done some projects together so i totally agree she's doing it but you're right it is a sacrifice but that's you know i'm gonna sound like a broken record here but that's also why i was so excited and intrigued about this notion of local worker co-op associations like um, No Boss and then eventually the Valley Alliance in uh, the Pioneer Valley of Massachusetts. Boston has work in, right? Madison had, has mad works because in a way having those local coalitions, local organizations was a way you know, in, in fact, there was sort of an initial idea that all these locals would have their own kind of convenings. Madworks now has their rendezvous, right? But the notion was all these local groups should have their rendezvous. Those rendezvous would then feed into regional conferences, right? And then the regional conferences would lead into the national. And the assumption was that not everybody could come or afford to go to a national, right? Especially if it wasn't in their region, but they all should be able to go to local meetings and they all should be able to hopefully go to regional meetings. And so that in some ways having groups of people traveling together and meeting each other, right? As opposed to it having to be one person trying to carry the weight of keeping everybody together. So I think that was also part of this, um, you know, kind of the road to national. And then it wasn't supposed to be an end road. It was supposed to be a, a continuing practice of different levels of people getting together so that we didn't have to depend on just one traveler who was going to um, sacrifice, uh, you know, what they were doing in their local and what they were doing with their family and that kind of thing. So for me, I think that's still maybe something we should be aspiring to is trying to figure out how to get more locals and more local activity that can then keep feeding into different levels um, so that we can keep engaging more and more people, talking together, learning from each other. Yeah, I've I've thought, uh, in, and I, I know we've talked about this maybe on a live stream previously, Chris, about um, like the how nice it would be to have some infrastructure for this kind of thing. Um, like as the example uh, where we've got connections with uh, people, the Mariposa housing co-op in San Francisco, and they're like, have an open invitation. Any of our, you know, our people are there, we've you know, got a place to stay and it would be so um, nice and, and, and facilitate this kind of travel and, 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 uh, and, and, and coordination that we're talking about. Um, if like, you know, uh, the, the local groups could also have like, figure out some some guest rooms and stuff for people because you know I think that would be great if you're set if you're trying to start a worker co-op or you're a new worker co-op in some particular industry and say I want to go to Madison and visit the people who've been doing this for 20 years and it'd be great if I didn't have to pay for a hotel room or something you know and have it, some kind of organization to kind of help you know facilitate the logistics of that kind of thing. Yeah, NASCO used to kind of do that. I guess they still do. I just haven't been to one of their conferences, but they always had solidarity housing um, at their conferences. Um, so some of the housing co-ops would have rooms or couches. Uh, other members would put somebody up. Um, so even before I think that couch surfing started happening, um, NASCO was already doing things like that to make sure their conferences were accessible and affordable. Um, but I think you're right, trying to figure out what those learning journeys might be and how right, how to make sure people can go on them. Because that's the other thing I think I like instead of just one traveler or each organization having just one traveler. Because I think the more people who learn and interact with other people, the better. It's not always as effective if only one member of the co-op or one member of the group goes and meets all these other people and learns about it, right? It's kind of better if a few a few people from the group or as many people from the group can have these experiences. Um, we tried to do, even GEO, right, tried to do a little bit with our quarterly meetings, right? We started thinking about them as being a, a chance to go to different places and set aside two, two evenings to actually meet other people who were in those places so that as a group, as GEO, we could start meeting other cooperators, other worker co-ops, other movement people, um, 
and be strategic about where our meetings were then, you know, uh, COVID happened and also we never really raised a lot of money to pay to bring people in person, whatever, but I think it's still an, a good strategy that we might think about again. And I think we're trying to think about that for our next retreat, right? Going somewhere where we can, um, where several people can afford to get to and we can meet the people who are doing stuff in that place. Yeah, I feel like that kind of system would benefit so many other parts of the solidarity economy. I mean, but maybe it already exists and we're just not aware of it. But I remember uh, many years ago, someone had made a really great comment. And um, it was a discord of the Autonomous Tenant Union Network where they said, hey, can we, someone basically said, can we get better at developing like a, a good way for like couch surfing? Um, and and uh, they were responding to something that I have been mentioning to locals too. Um, Cause I, I've noticed that a lot of people don't even want to do that anymore. A lot of people have so many negative experiences. And to me, some negative experiences are, are okay, but as long as we're kind of like learning from them, and getting better about it. But I've seen all sorts of um, scenarios where people just don't want to do it anymore. And supposedly that came up too um, last year in Chicago that a lot of people who had uh, a couch to spare or something for a lot of the Venezuelans who were coming in and who were homeless, like they, they wanted to do it, but they had already been burned so many times and they didn't, they didn't want to get burned again. And I, I, I totally get it. If we can get, <laughs> if we can figure that out. I think we we'll benefit a lot of sectors of society, a lot of, a lot of struggles. Um, <laughs> rules of the road rules of travel and then there's also the pro-indigenous aspect too that's one reason why i don't really travel that much too because i i i, I want to be in solidarity with the other native folks and um i kind of feel like uh traveling without you know actively being able to meet with other native folks and talk about like the struggles that we're going through um I feel like not being able to do that is a very disempowering thing. Um, anyway, that's one thing that I think about. Um, but yeah, what else you got, Josh or Jessica? You were the one with well, the list of questions, Chris. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I could keep talking about the experiences. So, um, you know, I was very intimately involved in starting the Eastern Co-op Conference for Workplace Democracy. And the first year, 2002, you know, we weren't really sure if anyone would come. I think actually, Chris, you had a question about something I said about it, about our attempt to get worker owners to be as involved as possible in the planning and execution of the conference because that was the model we had from the Western worker co-ops, right? In fact, um, Bob literally asked their organizer, you know, for her, I don't know what you call it, her files or her timesheets about how she organized the Western conference and that kind of stuff. And all through the Western conference, there's lots of, I would guess mandates is too strong a word, but lots of intentions to make sure that people making decisions about what content to have on the conference, making decisions about where to hold it, what to do, were worker owners themselves. So it was very much a bottom up and the people most affected, right? The worker owners kind of making decisions. On the East Coast, we didn't have as many activist worker co-ops who were interested in doing this kind of planning and they weren't as uh, older entrenched and so they didn't have like extra money to put in um and but we did have a lot of support organizations who were interested and excited and involved right so we tried to figure out a way to utilize the fact that we were able to raise some decent money we had a lot of volunteer and staff from support organizations who had time to put in 
but yet we still wanted to hear those voices from worker co-ops. So we ended up with a kind of bifurcated structure. We had a planning program committee um, run by Carol Hack from SACO, Southern Appalachian Co-op something, I don't remember what SACO stands for. Uh, Frank Adams, a, a sort of famous worker owner developer, and he wrote a book on how to start a worker co-op. He was one of the co-founders of that, and Carol was one of the, um, I don't know if she was co-director at that point or what, but anyway, she knew a lot of the co-ops, especially in the Southeast, um, and was able to pull them together not as often as the logistical planning committee met, but she was able to pull them together, get their ideas for content, what kind of workshops, what kind of best practices, what kind of questions they had that they wanted the, co the conference to cover. Um, and so that's how we did it, kind of separated the content out um, and bothered those people less. And then the sort of fundraising logistics, all that other stuff, those of us who had other jobs and who had capacity and that kind of thing handled that side. Um, but we also talked about how to get people to actually attend the conference because again, a lot of the worker co-ops we knew in the East and we did East Coast from Northeast to Southeast and all the way over to Ohio. So a little bit into the Midwest was our, um, actually anyone was invited, but that was kind of the boundaries in terms of who we were trying to uh, to uh, attract, um, and so we we also realized that some of these fledging and small worker co-ops were reluctant to send anyone to a regional conference again because both of the cost to get there, but also the cost of losing a worker member's time, right? <laughs> If you have a five or 10 person or even 20 person co-op, having someone gone for two or three days was is a real sacrifice, right? So we also thought about the Western actually paid people for their planning time and paid presenters for their time. We tried to do the model without doing that unless it was a worker owner who needed their time paid for. And we thought about trying to figure out stipends, but nobody could totally agree on it. And so we never really came up with a foolproof way to get more worker owner participation. But we did start to raise money for scholarships, both registration scholarships and travel scholarships. And so we did pretty well. We had an auction to try to, that was specifically to raise money for scholarships. Um, we asked some of the sponsors to specifically put money in for scholarships. And I think that practice is still going on. Um, but that was another way that we tried to figure out how to help people. And then we at least tried to talk about, right, what does it mean for your co-op to either have to shut down so all of you can come or <laughs> for you to lose, you know, some work for a day or two and you know how that would look and and what we should do about that um and as i said i don't think we ever really came up as a community or as a movement with a foolproof way but we did we do have some stopgap things and then i guess with uh after covid with some virtual meetings maybe we did better with people being able to attend virtually and not having to pay to get somewhere. But again, that was also why we like the idea of starting with local organizations, because at least people could participate at their local level, even if they couldn't make it to a regional conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's definitely something I think we need to get back to. I would like to see a lot more, re like not just regional, but like municipal, you know, small, or it, like for a small geographic area uh, events to bring uh, just people interested in, in co-ops together. Um, because I think there might, personally, I feel like there's too much emphasis on the big yearly conferences and not, and there should be, um, that are, as you say, they're kind of, there's a certain like exclusivity to them. There's certain barriers that are in place. You have to be able to often travel long distance. You gotta be able to afford to stay someplace. Um, and besides missing your your work and all that so you know having 
you know, more events that are smaller and that take less um, overhead and less planning time, you know, more of like the open conference kind of uh, style of organizing maybe uh, to help with that and just and, and more on the on the local level. Um, I think that's, that's that's something that's is really needed right now. Yeah. Remember that like we always want to do that, you know. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I feel like I've seen that dynamic in other orgs too, where like the so-called national and, and the United States is humongous. It's humongous. It's like this. There's many, many countries can fit in the United States. And, you know, those smaller countries, they do like a national thing for them every year is not even sustainable. And then we're trying to do that in this humongous continent. Um, I, I feel like that kind of thing you know, the yearly gathering uh, on such a wide scale is, it, I feel like it, it produces like um, nation state sociology and consciousness <laughs> and like dynamics and sensibilities. Um, I've seen it in other orgs too. And I usually kind of like refuse to participate. Um, I don't, and, and it's, it's really hard. I've seen where like, like th this happens in the industrial workers of the world where you know, you have like a group that's new, they want to affiliate and there's like all this pressure to participate in things outside of the local, but you have like that very little people power and to take on all these responsibilities for, for like a well-established local, it might not be much, but for these groups that are so new, like they can't really spare that much time to even like read all the things that are being brought to the convention and all that. It's yeah that's something i think about quite a bit um yeah i mean there's definitely benefits to doing something at the national level right because that's where you can sort of there can be one voice especially if you're trying to get legislation passed and things like that right you have a chance for there to be one voice for everybody to hear the same stuff and participate in the same way right there's ways that the national can be supportive of the locals um so I, I i can see both sides but i think what we're talking about and you know we're grassroots economic organizing so we're thinking about right what's the most benefit for the most people right and i think you know i agree it would be great if we could bring back more local activity people getting people involved at the local level I think the alternating years, you know, is still okay for national. Um, but I'm also thinking about the model of the uh, right to the city. They actually raise enough money to pay for every member organization to bring two or three people um, to their national. I don't know exactly how they afford it. I don't, right? But I do know because one of the organizations I work with. Um, has a program with them. And I think it was uh, a member leader, a grassroots organizer, and maybe a staffer or something all get, basically get their trip paid, including lodging and travel, everything, um, which is really great. And I can't remember if they, I don't know if they do annual meetings that way or every other year or what. But anyway, it seems like there's ways to do both, right? To get people at a national, because it is nice to have everybody kind of together, learning the same things, advocating for specific things and stuff. But I do, I'm definitely one of those people who I think the most impact happens at the local, at the smaller level, where more people can be involved. People aren't as worried about whether they're, tra you know, have to travel, they still can either stay home or be nearby, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing we did make sure was to have childcare, right? So even for the people who could come, we made sure that there was uh, good quality, high quality childcare and that children and young people were invited to be there. Um, because again, we wanted to make sure families, people with families didn't feel like they had to come without their families or that they didn't have coverage for their, you know, because I think that's also important to, to not see people as individuals, but as parts of families and parts of organizations. So figuring out how to, mo you know, how to facilitate the, their time, energy as people 
connected to gr other groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like it's not, it's definitely not an either or situation. I mean, I've, you know, been to a couple national conferences. They're amazing. They're great. You know, I do enjoy them. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to meet people that you've only heard about or read about their co-ops um, or never have heard about their co-ops and to get to hear about them for the first time is, is great. And to share ideas with people and to just be surrounded by so many people who are um, like-minded, uh, especially for me, you know, being from a pretty, uh, rural place you know that's it's nice to be around a whole lot of like-minded people i don't usually get the opportunity um but you know it, it it's uh i guess kind of to reiterate or maybe to expand a little bit on on my thought before um you know with the national conferences versus more local gatherings and even with national organizations versus more local ones um I, it, it it seems to me like it's akin to the difference between a, like high touch and low touch cooperative development, right? Like at a national conference and with the national organization, you can get that kind of low touch support and help, but it's like, it's, it's one, it's only going to reach a few people because you have one organization. And as Chris pointed out, we're a massive country with a lot of people. And, um, and then, you know, you're only going to be able to like limit it in time, right? You're only going to be able to provide any kind of support while people are there. Um, and so it's like, we need both, both of those. And it does, it feels to me like, because this national level stuff is, is more sexy for lack of a better term, it's just more exciting and seems like more important, um, that that gets a lot of, um, a, a lot of the, the energy and focus from people. And that, um, you know, I would like personally to, to for, you know, kind of see a, a, a shifting of, of more of that that time and energy being put into a lot more local uh, things and kind of, you know, have the subsidiary subsidiarity like idea that, you know, the larger the organization kind of the, the looser and, and less important it should be. Um, so. But anyway, um, yeah, Chris, good point. Right. sorry, okay. I know Chris has right. another question, but um, he said his mic isn't where, oh, no, Matt. Oh, Matt's here. But no, yeah, Mike. Matt, Matt's over. Yeah, he's sitting in the green room, but uh, oh, okay. his devices are not connecting. So yeah, sorry. Um, before Chris asks his next question, I did want to say one more thing about the importance of the U.S. having a national federation of worker co-ops. Um, worker co-ops were the, have been the smallest sector in the US co-op movement. And they really had almost no voice. In fact, um, part of my uh, thank you speech when I was inducted into the co-op hall of fame was to mention um, that I hoped and that I thought I saw the US co-op movement not being as siloed as it used to be and recognizing more the worker co-ops and some of the urban co-ops and stuff. When I first joined, there were very few urban co-ops or very little talk about urban co-ops. There was very little talk about people of color in the co-op movement, people of color co-ops, and the sectors were totally isolated from each other. Um, and the worker co-op sector was like, people had no respect for it. <laughs> Um, and so it was important for the U.S. to get the worker co-ops together so that we did have a, a, an official sector. And so we did have a voice. We did have a say. Now we actually have reps on the, the National Cooperative Business Association's board, right? We're represented in SACOPA, the national, uh, this International Association for uh, Worker Co-ops. Um, and we're able to connect better with like the Canadian Federation and uh, other groups But we're finally, you know, but we finally were able to be recognized. And then the really fantastic thing is, you know, now by 2024, the worker co-op sector is one of the fastest growing of the US co-op sectors, which is really amazing. Um, Cause some of the other sectors have actually like ag have been waning. Um, 
but you know, purchasing co-ops, worker co-ops, actually food co-ops are now on the rise again. And so it's interesting, the co-ops that didn't always have uh, as much representation and as much status are now actually the ones, again, they're more kind of grassroots based and they're, and they're growing faster. Uh, and the worker co-ops, right, are predominantly actually women of color, right? A lot of, most of the new worker co-ops um, are growing among women of color, which is also really interesting.